There's a couple things I want to go over today uh, and uh, that I find very interesting. If you have been a member of my website or channel for very long, you know that I believe that eventually the peace that will come between uh, Israel, the Antichrist, and many uh, will finally be uh, brokered by the Middle East, or I'm sorry, the uh, European Union, or should I say a man that will come out of the European Union, which will be the Antichrist. I believe that in time that uh, the United States will finally uh, just simply give up on uh, the Middle East and will uh, walk away from the peace deal. And I think that's where the European Union will finally step in. I think it probably won't take place until after the rapture, but uh, it's going to happen. As we know in Daniel 9, 25 through 27, the Bible says that uh, the peace will be from the, from the uh, people who that destroyed Jerusalem. Uh, which were the Romans. So there are some who believe that uh, that could very well be the um, Arab side of the Roman Empire, but uh, I just read an interesting piece by uh, Dr. David Reagan and uh, his, at his website. And actually the author of the uh, article seen, looks to be uh, Nathan Jones, one of his evangelists and web ma uh, ministers. Uh, and the name of the ministry is lambandlionministries.com. And this is what it says, I believe the uh, best response to this claim that the people who destroyed the temple were future uh, Muslims is in the research of Sean Osborne of Eschatology Today. Sean studied the history, of, uh, history and found out exactly what uh, peoples comprised of Titus Vespian's uh, army. He wrote, and he's quoting Sean now saying that the Roman army that destroyed the temple in AD uh, 70 were those of the Legio the 10th Fretinus, Legio the 5th Macedonia, and Legio the 15th Apollinaris under the command of Roman general Titus Vespasianus. In sum, the people of the prince were Europeans and Roman citizens. Yes, Titus also brought in mercenaries from the Middle East, but the majority of the people that attacked Israel were of pure Roman blood. They were Roman citizens. So looking at the history of the descendants of the people uh, that did uh, destroy Jerusalem and the temple, uh, they definitely were not of the European, or I'm sorry, of the uh, Islamic side of the European Union. But going back to the article that I originally want to talk about, it says the Great American Withdrawals. And here's what the article say, says, the uh, most important city in the Middle East is Washington. As we are now learning day by day, the region we live in is diseased and stricken. Arab national identity failed to crystallize into a confident modern identity that is true to itself and able to live in peace with uh, itself. The Arab nation states have never become properly run states that are able to withhold democracy, respect human rights, and grant uh, equality to minorities. Arab politics was and remains the politics of tyranny or chaos. Even in the 21st century, you cannot find a single enlightened Arab state between the Atlantic Ocean and the Persian Gulf, one that gives its citizens what states like Poland or South Korea or Brazil were, uh, have learned to give, give their citizens. While most of the human world is progressing, the Arab world is regressing. Thus, the American empire is the only agent that can moderate and stabilize the Middle East to some extent. Washington is the one city to which the oppressed and threatened in the Arab world still lift their eyes. But Washington is fed up with the Middle East. It has its reasons. In the 1990s, it tried to generate a peace revolution in the region, and it failed. In the 2000s, it tried to generate a democratic revolution in the region, and it failed. In the spring of 2011, it tried to believe in the Arab Spring, and it found it to be an illusion. In the course of all this, it invested $2 trillion in pointless wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It also invested a considerable portion of its political capital in various attempts to turn residents of the Middle East into what they refused to be. So now, Washington has very good reasons to stand aside as the Iranians become a nuclear power and as the Syrians butcher each other and as, e as Egypt, Iraq, and Libya implode. 
Washington's state of mind these days is one of withdrawal. And that is true because they're heading for East Asia and the China-Japan area. That is really their next uh, stop and where they really want to be at this time, where they feel they need to, to uh, put most of their resources in. But going on with the article, it says, After the rash withdrawal from Iraq and the rash withdrawal taking place from uh, Afghanistan, now it is the turn of the rash withdrawal from the war on terror. Time and again, the Americans declare victory, leave behind violent disorder, and go away. All these dangerous withdrawals reflect a new, deep, and un, uh, understandable American wish to get out, to be done with it, to turn its back on the Middle East and not hear about it anymore, to erase the Middle East from consciousness. And they also point out a reason behind that, and I, I agree with it. It says it's also possible that its approaching energy independence, not talking about the United States, will enable the United States to shift its focus from the sinking Near East to the rising Far East. So if, in fact, the uh, uh, analysts are true that the United States will be energy independent by 2017, uh, this very well may become uh, uh, a prophecy of sorts regarding the Middle East that, for which the United States will leave. And in closing, this is what the author says. says, but for anyone living in the Arab world or near it, the winds of withdrawal now blowing over the Potomac bode ill. The Middle East, after losing all previous hope, is now losing the hope of Washington as well. If the wildest region in the world finds itself outside the sphere of protection and interest of the world's capital, may Allah have mercy on it. And of course this is from, I guess, a uh, uh, Muslim perspective, but uh, the bottom line is, is may God have mercy on them as well. For we know that's the only mercy that uh, anyone can ab ever count on. But this is exactly what I've been saying for years. I believe that uh, the United States is on its way out of the Middle East. And uh, if this peace attempt that they are now trying does not uh, come to fruition, you, I have to believe that they will be withdrawing from the Middle East. And the Bible says that the man of sin will at some point arise and will bring peace to the region. Now on to another portion of the uh, of an, a, re a report that I wanted to bring and you know as you know uh, there are reports that Russia has now shipped the S-300s. Uh, it was confirmed basically by Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Well, whether it's true or not we don't know but uh, I you know and uh, Israel has stated that they would uh, take military measures to stop that uh, shipment from going through if indeed that was what was necessary. So we don't know positively yet that uh, it is uh, confirmed by a reasonable source. But I really haven't uh, I really haven't commented on this particular situation because I wanted to wait and see what some of the analysts had to say and what uh, uh, you know I, I you can read such you know some of the different magazines or different some of the different websites but the bottom line is everybody's jumping on the the war wagon or whatever the case may be because uh Syria is getting these could possibly get these S300s I simply I simply don't just jump on to a bandwagon just because it's there I need to know what the uh implications of this really are not according to some newspaper who's trying to sell mag uh not trying to sell subscriptions or uh, you know, whatever the case may be. So I waited for to see if Stratfort was going to go ahead and do a report on this, and sure enough, they have. And the name of their article is Syria Misplaced Concern Over Possible Russian Missile Shipments. And this is what the article says. It reports that, the Russian, that Russia has delivered S-300 uh, air defense missile batteries to Syria have yet to be confirmed. But even if the reports are true, the missiles would have a fairly negligible impact beyond deterring possible a military intervention in the future. According to the New York Times, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad confirmed May 30th that uh, Russia already had delivered some of these weapons systems and that more were on the way. So far, no one else has confirmed the delivery. However, the concern surrounding their introduction to the Syrian civil war uh, is fairly overstated. And here's their analysis of that. It says that the S-300s need to be kept in perspective with their considerable range and they cover the full spectrum of aerial threats. Uh, they can target uh, 
strategic enabler aircraft such as aerial refueling uh, tankers and early warning aircraft and defend against low flying cruise missiles but these missiles indeed any surface to air missile are completely useless against the Syrian rebels who have neither an air force nor the munitions the uh, S-300s are designed to combat, combat. When integrated in an overlapping and mutually supporting integrated air defense system as it would be in Syria, the S-300 is a sophisticated weapon. Typically it operates in concert with several other surface-to-air missiles, short-range but versatile point defense systems, such as the Panzer uh, S-1 which uh, Syria operates and the TOR missile system uh, work to uh, shield the S-300 from enemy anti-radiation missiles and other threats. However, the S-300 are vulnerable to attacking when they are deployed outside larger missile defense networks. For this reason, the batteries will be of little use uh, to non-state actors such as Hezbollah and jihadists. Technically, missiles are mobile but in reality the batteries are not very maneuverable and are highly conspicuous. Moreover, their radar emissions keep them easy to detect. Non-state actors would be better served using other low-tech surface-to-air missiles such as the 9K-33 AZA and the 9K-35 Strela-10. In addition, the S-300s are complex weapons that require significant expertise to operate and it is unclear whether the Syrian military has received the requisite training. Given their sophistication, S-300s would necessitate several months of training to acquire basic competency. If Syrian crews have not already been trained in Russia, then Russian personnel would have to at least partly operate the missile systems. While the S-300s are worthless in the fight against Syrian rebels, they are nonetheless useful for other reasons, namely discouraging an, uh, any military intervention. Once fully integrated into the Syrian air defense network, the S-300s will help deter foreign airstrikes. Certainly the batteries alone will not be able to repel a NATO or Israeli air campaign, but they will raise the risk of damage and casualties involved in, uh, in, in an intervention. Moreover, if Russian personnel are needed to operate the systems, their presence would also deter military intervention. In addition, the S-300 would enable Syria to strike deep into Israeli and Lebanese airspace. The, this would threaten a key aspect of Israel's military dominance of Syria. Israel has long been concerned with the presence of S-300s in the region, so it comes as no surprise that Israeli Defense Minister Yalan warned of an Israeli response in the event Syria acquired the missiles. Yalan also said the delivery had not yet been made. Diplomatic efforts are expected to continue in hopes of convincing Russia to halt the delivery. If these, system, or if these efforts fail, Israel has several options to disable the systems, including standoff cruise missile strikes and AGM-78s, or possibly in the future the AGM-88 and anti-radiation missiles. If confirmed, the delivery of the S-300s will damage Israeli uh, Russian relations. Now, what Russia Russia's defense is that they basically were just fulfilling a contractual agreement that they made long before the revolution, or should I say, the, the civil war took place. So it was it was it predated the civil war. And getting back to the article, it says, however, the timing of the alleged delivery sends a political message. Russia is unhappy with the European Union for lifting its weapons embargo to Syria and it is unhappy with the United States for refusing to strike a larger bargain to work with Russia on the Syrian issue. The delivery could be a message to the West that Moscow still has leverage. Beyond the alleged delivery of the S-300 system, it is important to highlight the sheer scope of Russian support for al-Assad. This support includes economic and financial aid, the delivery of spare parts for military equipment, and according to a document published May 30th in the Washington Post, other weapons and ammunition germane to the outgoing conflict. At the same time, Russia is organizing another peace conference with the United States to show that it can play a role other than al-Assad's 
primary weapons supplier. Absent a fundamental understanding with the United States on more strategic uh, issues, Israel's, or I'm sorry, Russia's core interest is to sustain al-Assad and prolong the conflict. For now, it is abundantly clear that uh, Moscow is not ready to sacrifice its influence of Damascus. And truthfully speaking, the long Israel, it's in Israel's best interest, and they know this, and I've read it in many different uh, intelligence reports, that this conflict go on as long as possible. Because truthfully speaking, the rebels nor the regime are Israel's friend. But if push were to come to shove, Israel would by far favor al-Assad to be in uh, power as opposed to the rebels because as I've said many times al-Assad knows exactly where he stands he can't defeat Israel and he certainly can't do it you know I hear a lot of people a lot of reports saying that uh, al-Assad says that once this rebel force is uh, crushed that he there there's gonna be a war with Israel that I can't believe that in a million years that that's gonna happen if Syria thought they were weak before this war started they're gonna be extremely weakened once it's over they will be in absolutely no shape to be fighting against a powerhouse like Israel. Now, where do we go from here? Well, fr frankly, what I believe is, as I said earlier, I believe the United States is finally going to be fed up with this peace uh, situation with the Middle East. And I think that uh, once the rapture of the church takes place, that the man of sin will come forth and he will miraculously bring peace. Uh, to the Middle East, not only with the Arab League, but I think that it's also going to include Syria and Iran. I know that sounds far-fetched, and I, I don't have anything to back that up, but the bottom line is, is uh, Daniel 9.27 does say that this peace will be with many. And I cannot even imagine that, there, that peace could be even possible unless Syria and Iran were involved. At least, in, I should say, at least in the Middle East. So I look for this stalemate in the Middle East uh, between Syria, uh, the regime, and the rebels to go on until possibly uh, the man of sin comes along and solves it. So am I saying that I believe that the rapture is near? Of course, I, I, I've said this for many, many years. As I said in my last video, that uh, I thought it was going to be years ago. But the bottom line is, is that we're on God's timeline and not our own. But I still, I'm still convinced that the rapture could take place at any moment. And uh, I, I, as I look around, I see the different... Uh, events that are taking place I have to believe that the rapture is imminent and this just in uh, I just received an email from one of my uh, viewers that they just received the Lord as Savior and you know what I want to invite you to do the same thing if you uh, have not accepted Jesus as Savior today is the day of salvation don't put it off um, you need to make that decision today uh, well this is Terry Malone with the Calvary Prophecy Report